Jack, we're all good? Okay. So I'd like to thank a couple of the sponsors for sponsoring this giveaway that's making all this giveaway possible for you guys to win and win a whole bunch of awesome stuff and also thank them for sponsoring this seminar here today. So I'd like to thank Sport Corner Actor Emporium, Silverhorn Gold Star, Berkeley Pro Gear, Angler Innovations, Rosie Olderberg Fine Art, Cook Fishing Products, Riverside Guide Service, and the Washington Sportsman Show for having me here for my first ever seminar. How are you doing today? Thank you all for joining me and having your time here to learn about Puget Sound squid fishing. I am Sebastian Chick, also known as Seabass, for those of you who don't know me. I am a pro staff ambassador for Sport Current Outdoor Emporium and also sponsored by a whole bunch of other great companies out there. Before we get started, just want to let everyone know I absolutely love fishing and I'm pretty much out there fishing every other day or whenever I get a chance to or whenever my parents let me. I've been squinting for a very long time now, ever since I was a little tiny three-year-old. There's me holding a stringer full of trout. That was down at Maggie Lake somewhere in Washington. You can see I'm pretty happy in that photo. That was probably one of my first ever fishing days. And I've been squinting for about five or six years now. There's me, that was about six years ago, holding a huge jumbo squid down at downtown Seattle, right underneath the Seattle Great Wheel back when pretty much squidding wasn't popular at all. And as you can see, there's only one other person back there squidding at the time. Squidding is super fun and easy to catch for all ages and all fishing capabilities. And it's really easy and simple to get started squidding. And hopefully today we can hopefully gain some new information and learn from each other. Here's another image of me right here down at my favorite dock, Secrets down at Elkai, holding a double squid on right there. The reason why it's my favorite dock is because I'm always down there, I'm always fishing. No matter what fishing season it is, whether it's squidding like you see here, crabbing, salmon fishing, bottom fishing, I'm always down there. I'm always fishing. It's just a great place for me to hang out at with the Seattle skyline in the background. That's really, really beautiful. That was a really good day of squidding there. So kind of moving into a little bit about squid and more into description about squid. These Pacific squid right here are opostulant or most commonly known as the market squid. They are cephalopods with elongated bodies, two large eyes, a jumble of eight arms, and two longer tentacles. They use those two longer tentacles to grab prey that is further out of reach for them to easier, that's easier to make so they can bring it in to all of their arms right here that have little tiny suction cups on them and eventually bring it into their beak that's right in the middle of all that that almost looks like a little parrot beak. The male squid uses a customized arm to deliver sperm to the female squid when they're spawning. And once the body or the mantle of the squid is then cut open, it is easier to tell whether your squid is a male or a female because when you're squidding out there, most of the squid are all the same size. It's really hard to tell. And it's just easier to tell whether your squid is a male or female when you cut it open. Cephalopods, just like this squid right here, are camouflaged and can change color to confuse their prey or escape predators. But the thing is, with these squid in Pacific, is that they're colorblind and they can't see color. But one thing that they can see instead of color is heat signatures coming off from the prey or whatever they're chasing when they're down there in the water. So say a squid was chugging along down the bottom and he's really hungry, he wants to feed on some fish. So instead of seeing the color from the fish, he will see the heat signature coming off from whatever they're feeding on. Moving into some spawning squid and the spawning behaviors of squid. These squid right here most commonly spawn in waters that have gently sloping bottoms anywhere from 15 to 60 feet deep, covering a small area anywhere just from a few of these to several hundred of these squid gelatinous egg cases that these squid lay can be found attached to certain underwater points such as rocks, pieces of seaweed, tree branches, logs that fell over in the water, pilings, anchors, even crab pots that people lost too. And each of these two to three inch cylindrical egg cases right here can be found, can range anywhere from 100 squid eggs or so. Here's an up close image of one of these squid egg sacks. As you can see, you can see little tiny 
outline of the squid egg right there with the little tiny squid right there. These squid can take up to seven weeks to hatch and are very dependent on the water temperature which is surrounding them. So if it's too hot or too cold, they won't hatch and they'll stay in that egg case. Often the male squid will die a short time after mating with the female squid and the female squid will die a short time just after laying her eggs right here. And because of this, the squids usually lay their eggs about once and have a very short lifespan of up to one to two years. Once these little tiny squid are born, they start feeding on small plants and smaller plankton. And as they start growing, they will start feeding on smaller crustaceans such as shrimps, crabs, small fish. In extreme cases, they can even eat other squids, so they are cannibalists at some times. And here's an image to kind of give you an idea of what these squid are doing when they're hanging out there on the bottom, whether they're mating or feeding. As you can see, this little squid right here just missed this little tiny shrimp that was scooting along the bottom. Kind of gives you an idea. You can see it's two longer tentacles right here that it tried to use to catch that squid, right, uh, that little tiny shrimp right there. There are two different types of squidding seasons here in the Puget Sound. There is a summer run and a winter run squidding season. The summer run squid are generally a lot smaller in size and come in much less numbers than the winter run squid. And the winter run usually come in a lot bigger numbers and the squid are a lot bigger. These winter squid can be found anywhere from 6 to 12 inches long, which is pretty big for squid. And the summer squid can range anywhere from a little small 2 inch squid to a 6 inch squid. So the size can vary from the squid. Location, location, location. There are lots of different places on which you can find these squid at. These squid right here can be found all along Washington's coast, the Strait of Juan de Fuca and Puget Sound. They're also found in large numbers around the Gulf of Mexico, Hawaii, and California. These squid have been identified from the North Pacific starting at the Bering Sea and all the way over to the Sea of Japan over here. And they also can be found all the way in Australia. So they can pretty much be found anywhere along the Pacific Ocean. Here is a image to kind of demonstrate the migrational patterns of these squid that migrate through here in, the, uh, in Washington state. When we're talking about migrating squid here, this is the average date and time on which these squid that show up here in the winter time that we usually see here in the rest of the Puget Sound. So they're first seen here in Nia Bay, first arriving around late May. They go further east through the, uh, through the Strait of Juan de Fuca into Port Angeles. They can be present there anywhere from late June to the end of August. Their next big decision to make is either to go up north to the San Juan Islands or distribute throughout the rest of the Puget Sound. And these squid that are found here in the Puget Sound arrive at Edmonds and they can be found along there anywhere from September. They can also be found in large numbers around Elliott Bay and the surrounding shoreline in Seattle. The reason why Elliott Bay is such a great place for these squid to hang out at is because it's a bay or a cove that is protected from the rest of the heavy Puget Sound currents that are flowing through the Puget Sound. And it's a great resting place for these squid to kind of hang out at, spawn, feed, and kind of take a break from them migrating through the Puget Sound. They're next found at Des Moines and Tacoma. They can be found anywhere there from late November to December. And finally distributing out through the rest of the South Sound is in Olympia, and they can be found there anywhere from December to January. Now these, these squid that are found here in the Puget Sound during the winter time can vary from year to year, whether it's a cold year or a warm year. You might have heard out of an El Nino or El Nino year, and that can really change the squid's mood pattern and kind of depend on which these squid arrive here. Like last year, actually no, the year before last year in 2017, these squid showed up really, really early especially here in Elliott Bay where we usually see them around October. We saw them in really, really early September. And last year for the 2018 squidding season, we found them in a really late November. So this is kind of like the average date and time which these squid can appear here for winter. Some rules and regulations on which to keep in mind when you're out there squidding are these right here. 
I get a whole bunch of questions either online or when I'm out there squidding is when the squidding season is open. It is open all year long, but the best times to fish for the squid is during the summer winter months when they're most abundant. You will need a shellfish license to catch these squid. So if you've gone crabbing in the past during the summer, you should have that shellfish license and you should be all good to go for squidding. There is no minimum size on these squid and there is a daily limit of five quarts or 10 pounds per person. And you can keep up to five Humboldt squid. These Humboldt squid are most, mostly found off the coast of Washington. So off of Westport, they're found most abundant there. There's some rare cases in which these humble squid have been found in the Puget Sound, but it's very rare. You can have a maximum of up to four squid lures on one line. You can use four squid lures, but recommending for beginner squid fishermen, one to two lures is perfect because say you've gone to a fishing pier that you've never gone there before. You don't know the structure of that pier and you had those four squid jigs on, you get snagged up, you lost those four jig jigs, it's four squid jigs, and it kind of sucks, you know, you just lost about 20 bucks worth of squid jigs. So usually one to two squid jigs is enough. One very important rule when you're out there squidding, and I've seen multiple times, which causes problems, is that each person that is squidding out there for that day must have a separate fishing container. It's kind of hard to explain, but it's just really important that you have a separate container, whether it's a bucket that I have right here or just a small plastic bag, just anything to put your squid in. But one thing that isn't really a rule or a regulation, it's just one thing that to kind of have out there when you're squidding is a scale because you want to know how much squid you have caught and how much squid you need left to catch for that day so you don't go over limit and you don't get a ticket by the WD of W. Moving on to some places on which you can squid, and the most popular place to squid, probably out of the Puget Sound, and my favorite place to squid, is this area right here. It is the Seattle Waterfront, the Seattle Great Wheel, and the Seattle Aquarium. This spot is such a great place for squidding, and the reason why I absolutely love squidding here is because you have the bright Seattle Wheel, and you have the awesome Seattle nightlife that happens there down on the waterfront. One reason why I like squidding here, especially at night, is because the Seattle Great Wheel produces enough light, which is super bright, so you don't have to bring your own light, and it's great for beginner squid fishermen, so they don't have to bring the extra gear when they're out there squidding, so they can specifically focus on squidding. There's bathrooms that are only a couple feet away from you uh, inside Pier 56 here, and there's also a whole bunch of great restaurants with my favorite, the, Seattle, uh, the Crab Pot right here. The Alaskan Way Viaduct is closed down and they're now tearing it down so there's no more parking underneath of it. But you can find parking in this little parking lot up here that is just across from the Seattle Aquarium. And there's also a parking garage that is off to the right of it over here. And you can also find two hour street parking just north of that which is free on Sundays and the holidays. If you want to go check out some fish, you can go to the Seattle Aquarium right there. And there's two awesome, amazing spots to squid, especially if you're starting off squidding, with one of them being on the, what I like to call the wheel side, because it's more close to the wheel. It can range anywhere from 10 to 25 feet deep, and the other side on the aquarium, which can range anywhere from 25 to 35 feet deep. These two spots are very productive for squid and are great places to start out squidding. One spot that I didn't mention on here is this area right here. I like to call it the 90 degrees or like the 90s, something like that. But it's more for advanced squid fishermen and that's why I didn't mark it. Because pretty much from right below where your feet is to about 30 to 40 feet out there, there's Thank this you. huge snaggy area where there's a whole bunch of dangers in which you can, you can get your squid jig snagged up at like logs, pilings, there's chairs and tables that people throw over when they're angry or got rejected on a date when they're out there hanging out at the Seattle waterfront. Uh, there's a cable line down there, just a whole bunch of dangers on which you can get snagged up at. And what they're doing is casting out super far into this little deep pool right here where these squid like to hang out and spawn at. But this year, for 2018, it's been a really productive spot for squidding, especially on the Seattle waterfront. These two spots can produce lots and lots of squid and it's a great spot for beginner, for beginner squid fishermen. 
If you run out of squid jigs or you want to get some more gear, you can head down to Outdoor Emporium in Seattle to replenish all that gear. They're only a couple minutes away. They have a whole bunch of stuff there for you. And if you're squidding down here in the south end near Tacoma, there's Sport Cone 5 on which you can also replenish a whole bunch of your gear. They have a whole wide selection for you to choose from. Other great places to squid along the Puget Sound are these places right here. <laughs> First, starting up north in Edmonds, there's Edmonds, Kayak Point Park, Everett Marina, Kingston, if you want to go travel across the water. There's Muckleteo, Golden Gardens and Ballard. Finally, reaching into Seattle, there's the Seattle Wheel and the Seattle and also Seacrest right there, which is my favorite dock. If you want to know where that is, it's pretty much like one minute away from uh, Salty's on Elk High, and it's also right next to a restaurant called Marination and the King County Water Taxi. So if you want to go down there fishing, you can see me. I'm pretty much down there fishing every day. There's also Des Moines, Waterman Dock, Redondo, Les Davis, Tacoma Pier, Ruston, Dash Point, uh, Bainbridge, Bemerton, and Point Defiance. Once you have all that in mind, you will need, of course, your gear to go out there squidding. First starting off with your rod and reel, right here. You know, pretty much any style of rod and reel will work for when you're squidding, but for your rod, you most likely want to think of something light and long because you want something that is sensitive enough and can telegraph any of those slight changes that will happen to your rod when you're squidding out there because those squid can bite very light at some times and you want to be able to feel those light bites so you can catch more squid. That's why a lot of people like using fly rods when they're out there squidding because it does that. I've used pretty much every single rod out there for squidding anywhere from a long flat rod that is really light and flimsy to a cheap $10 Walmart pole for specifically for trout. I've caught squid in all of those, and they all work, but what I found out is the best rod for squidding and what I've been using exclusively for this year is, where did I put the clicker? There it is. Is this rod right here that I have in my hand. It is the Berkley Lightning Rod, and this thing is an absolute beast for squidding. If you want to get it, you can get it down just over at the Sport Coin After Emporium booth. They have a couple of these rods in stock, so you can get them. It is a seven foot medium action trout rod that is absolutely amazing. It has a whole bunch of specs on it. It has a multi-modulus carbon composite rod blunt construction. So it's super light, it's super durable. It has dual reel locking seats with exposed blanks so you can feel those lighter bites and so your reel won't slip. It has a rubberized cork handle so it will last you a long time and it has aluminum inserts and aluminum oxide inserts as well. So it lasts a long time. Super durable and fish is really good for squidding. Comparing this rod right here to another rod that I've been using in the past for squidding and comparing it side by side, these rods are pretty much identical to each other. With this one right here that I've been using in past years, which is a lamb and glass rod, that is more, the, more on the expensive end. And this Berkeley rod right here that I'm using specifically for this year that is more on the affordable end. And you can see that for yourselves at the Sport Co booth just inside the main building over there. And if you want to feel the difference for yourselves and take the Berkeley Challenge, you can come up here and feel these two rods after the seminar. Just kind of feel how they feel, how they feel, feel how light they are, feel the action of it. This rod is just an absolute amazing rod for squidding and I absolutely love it. Right there, Slayer Squad member Jack, he's been using it, he's been loving it. So it's just a really great rod for squidding. For your line for squidding, you can use either braided or mono. I like using braided when I'm out there squidding for many reasons. One thing that I like about the braid is that it has no stretch resistance, so it can't stretch unlike the mono. And with that, you can, you can have an instant reaction. You can feel those lighter bites without having that sensitivity. And it's a lot easier to undo those snags if you do get snagged up because you don't have that stretch. But what is more widely used by fishermen and what is more common out there is mono right here. The reason why a lot of people like it is because it has a high visibility at night with many colors from a super bright orange, super bright chartreuse, super bright green. It's more widely used out there by fishermen. It's more common. It's a lot more uh, effective in your price range. For your pound test, you want to use anywhere from a 15 to 20 pound. It's perfect for your main line. 
and you wanna use 30 to 50 pound mono for your leader for squidding, and I'll talk about that later. Another great way to identify where your line is is with the corky, just like I have around right here. I mean, I've seen any people out there using anywhere from a golf ball size corky to a little small eight millimeter. It doesn't really matter what size you have on there as long as you have something that is big and bright and that people can see because you don't want people casting over your line and getting all tangled up right in the middle of when squidding is very, very good and you're trying to catch as many squid as possible. This is just another great way to identify where your line is. For your bucket, I have also right here, a two gallon bucket is perfect for squidding. This is what I have right here. Um, it holds the right amount of squid when you're out there squidding. You don't have to guesstimate on how much squid you have. This pretty much holds about 10 pounds of squid easily. What you might also want to invest in is a dollar score basket for a dollar. It works really good as a strainer. And to keep all those excess liquids and ink out of your squid, it keeps your catch a lot cleaner. And it's great for rainy days because if it's a tough day out there squidding, you want to catch as much squid as possible with having the less weight. So you want to dump out that excess water and it keeps your catch a lot cleaner. No, did it die? Wait. No. Oh man, okay. Looks like I gotta press this then. Moving on to kind of your light and battery. If you've never gone squinting before and you're looking more into a light and battery, if you've gone squinting before, you're kind of thinking about it and you're looking for the best and effective way to use for your light and battery setup. This right here is a perfect setup for you. Oh. First starting off with your shop light. This can range anywhere from $6 you can get at any hardware store. It's perfect to hold your light. It has a little clamp right there so it can easily attach to any docks, um, like the railing, so it's easy to mount. A 90 watt LED light bulb is perfect. It's super bright, uses less power, and it's a lot brighter than any of the conventional light bulbs that are non-LED out there. You can get that for about 20 bucks at, again, any hardware store. And a 400 watt power converter to convert your power from your battery. Anything more wouldn't be unnecessary for this setup, but if you're thinking about a much bigger light setup, you want to think of maybe upgrading to a generator because it can has more power to generate and it has a bigger power capacity. But for this setup, this right here is perfect. A 12 volt Optima battery is absolutely amazing for this setup. I've been using Optima batteries for a long time now, not only for squidding, but for to power my electric motor that I use for my boat. It charges fast, lasts a long time. Since it's a dry cell, like don't, almost like a battery, if you accidentally kick it over, if you accidentally tip it over, it won't spill acid everywhere, unlike a conventional battery. You can get it for about 250 bucks at any auto parts store. It lasts you a long time, so it's worth the money spending on a battery. It's a lot better than any of those conventional 12-volt uh, car batteries that are out there. One great thing to have out there to make your transport for all of your light and battery setup easier is this right here. It is called the Quick Cart. I found it online for about 30 bucks. It's made of heavy-duty aluminum and heavy-duty plastic. The lid can support up to 250 pounds, so you can easily use it as a step stool or a place to sit down if there's no benches. Its weight capacity is about 80 pounds, so it's, it can easily fit any of your gear in there. Since it has a kind of storage compartment there, it keeps, out of your, keeps all of your gear kind of out of the elements and makes it last a long time. It can also fold into this little three inch travel case so you can easily throw it into the back of your car. If, you're, if you have a small car, you want to keep everything compact and portable. Moving on to your jigs allure presentation. Let me move back over here. There are two different methods on which you can set up your jigs for squidding. With this one right here, the most conventional way, you can come up here after the show and check it out for yourselves. It's pretty simple to set up with your lighter jig, your lighter and much smaller jig up on top, and your much heavier and bigger jig on the bottom. It's great for if you're starting out squidding, you want to have something easy to set up. For your leader for this, it's pretty simple. All you need is 30 to 50 pound line. 
The reason why I said 30 to 50 pound is because with that thicker line, especially for mono, if you do get tangled up in your uh, squid jig, say like that, you can easily see your line and undo it. Unlike if you have lighter line, you're out there fishing in the dark and it's just all tangled up yet, eventually have to cut it off. It also lasts a long time and there's no kinks in it if you do get snagged up or kind of looped around. And then after that, pretty much about 12 to 18 inches of that 30 to 50 pound a liter to a snap swivel on each end. So you can easily exchange your jigs if you want to change a different color, different weight, or you want to change a different setup. You might want to consider putting a snap swivel onto the end of your main line so you can easily change out that jig or a different setup. And then of course your corky. Another setup, and also this just gives you one action, that vertical jigging action. Another setup that I've been using in past years and has been working really good for squidding for me is something I like to call the dropper method. If you've been fishing before, you might have seen dropper, different dropper methods out there, not only for squidding. It's pretty easy to tie with this line up here to a much lighter and unweighted squid jig with about two to three inches of line on there. This gives a much more natural and free-flowing look to the squid jig, unlike if it was tied on normally and just tied on straight to your leader. This gives a different presentation than this squid jig down here, which is the normal vertical jigging action. And that's why I believe this is such an effective rig because it has those two different presentations for the squid to look at. There are a multitude of different type of squid jigs out there. There's football jigs, skinny, small, long, weighted, weightless, homemade, store-bought, all of them work, all of them catch fish. That's, yeah, pretty much. But what I like using the most are these two squid jigs right here. This one right here is from Silverhorn Gold Star. It's an all pink, powder coated, long, skinny, and weighted squid jig. Unlike this squid jig right here, which one of my friends made, that is a football type jig that is weighted, covered in mylar, so which is a different material. The reason why I like using this squid jig right here more than this one is because the powder coated material lasts a long time. It's easier to maintenance, easier to clean off, lasts a lot longer than the mylar jig because if dirt or squid ink perhaps gets on this mylar jig, it's really hard to get out. That's why I just like using the powder coat. It's just a lot easier on me when I'm squidding. This squid jig that I've been using for my dropper setup that I've been using for the past three years and I've been field testing is this squid jig right here. It is the Silverhorn Gold Star Yamashita Naori squid jig. I do have these squid jigs in with the prize pack. So if you are fortunate enough to win one of these, you can try it out for yourself and see how good it is. It's a unweighted, the texture and uh, kind of the feel to it. It's a squishy, small, light jig that you can put on easy on a dropping line like this. But the reason why I think it's so effective and it's different from the rest of the squid jig out there is because it has a specific feature in it called a warm jacket. And like I stated before, squid can see heat. And since they can see heat, this squid jig then has a warm jacket and the squid can see. So instead of seeing that color, they can see the heat signature coming off from the squid jig and easily imitates a bait fish that a squid would be seeing down, down there when they're swimming in the water imitates and looks exactly like the same and that's why I think it's more effective than the other squid jigs that are out there. You can also find that squid jig at Sportcon Outdoor Emporium if you want to check it out for yourself. There are three different methods of jigging your jigs for squidding. One of them being the vertical jigging. It's a pretty simple and straightforward action. It's most effective to when there's squid right below you and the squid are basically pulled up in a really big school and you're trying to catch as much squid as possible uh, for however the squid run is. Actually, let me move over to this side. It's a lot easier for people to see. It's pretty simple and straightforward. All you need to do is basically drop it down right in front of you. Drop it down to the desired depth in which you want your squid jigs and basically jigging up and slowly dropping it back down. Just like that. That's why it's called vertical because it's up and down. How you can kind of tell you have a squid on there is the slight change in weight and your rod will load up in weight. 
and how you want to jig your squid jigs is this right here. So when you're first starting out, you want to kind of start at a horizontal point. And once you get to that horizontal point in the water, then you want to jig up to about a 45 degree angle and then slowly dropping it back down, making sure that you have tension with those squid jigs. Because if you jig it up and then slowly, like quickly drop it back down, you're not giving it the right action that these squid like. So they kind of like that a lot more subtle and more natural flow to the squid jigs. There's another method called drifting, which is again, pretty simple. All you have to do is cast it out to however far you want. And after that, dropping it down to whatever depth you want, then basically jigging and drifting your squid jigs back towards you and letting it kind of swing back towards you. And that's why it's called drifting because you're not reeling in any line and you're kind of letting those squid jigs kind of work the water. Lastly, something like it's called a hop. It's a very effective way and method of squid squidding, especially when you're trying to find the squid out there and when the squid aren't biting. And that's what a lot of advanced fishermen, squid fishermen do when they're out there, out on uh, the Seattle waterfront, is where they cast out pretty much as far as they can, let it sink all the way down to the bottom. And to kind of give you an idea of what it would look like, is this right here. You drop it down to the bottom and you slowly jig it up off the bottom, reeling in any slack line and letting it hit the bottom back down, kind of drift jigging and hopping that squid jig off the bottom. And it would mimic perfectly just like any small crustacean like a shrimp or a fish. And even if you're using this longer squid jig right here, it even mimics another squid that's down there mating in the water. It's just a really effective way to finding these squid and is really effective to when those squid are really hard to find and way out from the pier or wherever you're fishing at. Once you have all of your squid caught and at home, you're ready to clean them. This is the most common way on how to cut them and you can use it for a variety of different uh, recipes for when you're cooking the squid. This method is cutting it into rings or calamari like you see in a store or any seafood restaurant. First, starting off with your squid, what you want to first do is separate the guts from the internal spine of the squid. So if you kind of see right here, there's this little point that sticks up from the squid where the beginning of the squid's internal shell is. And you want to stick your finger in and separate any of those guts that's attached along the pen. Then after that, pinching just behind the eye of the squid right here, right where the neck is, and holding the rest of the squid with your body, with your hand, then pulling all out the guts. And after that, if you want to eat tentacles or if you're into that kind of thing, you can cut the tentacles off just by cutting with scissors right above the eye of the squid right there. And after that, you want to take the beak out because you don't want to eat that. I've actually done that once. It's not pleasant. You want to take the squid's beak out right here, which is like a little ball that has its beak in it and all its muscles. That's kind of what it looks like right there. Next, what you want to do is you want to take the internal shell of the squid out so you can easily pinch right here on each side to kind of separate the internal shell from the body of the squid and easily pull it out. Just like this, kind of looks like a piece of plastic. After that, you can stick your finger back in and get out any excess guts that you accidentally missed when you're pulling out uh, the rest of the guts that you did in your first step. Then you'll have a fully gutted squid. And next, what you want to do is you want to skin your squid. You can eat the squid how it is like this and cut it, but it's just a lot, tastes a lot better and it's easier to present when the squid is, uh, the skin is off. So right here, you can easily kind of peel back the skin right here, right behind where the squid's uh, fin is right here, where they control their swimming direction. So you can kind of put your fingernail right there and kind of dig into it a little bit, separating that fin, then peeling it off and peeling off the skin with it. If you then miss any skin with that, you can easily peel it off. It's pretty easy. When you peel it off, it's kind of slimy. And just peel it all off. There you go. You have a fully gutted and skinned squid. And next, you want to cut the squid into little small half inch rings. And that's what we're doing it. Easily with scissors. And you want to do that pretty much all along the squid right here. Just like that. All along the squid. 
you will have a fully gutted skin and cut squid ready to cook. There are three different ways that personally I like and are more for advanced, intermediate, and easiest ways on how to cook your squid. First, starting off with the more advanced way with an ink pasta, something that my dad loves to make. It takes, it's a lot more time consuming, but in the end, it looks cool and tastes really good. So he incorporates the squid ink in with the spaghetti noodles right there. And that's why it's black. I know when you're eating it, I've tried it before. It tastes like normal spaghetti. It's just, you have that weird black spaghetti noodle in there. You can also sprinkle the squid throughout the dish. It's really good, more for advanced uh, people that know how to cook. More intermediate way, that's pretty simple, is through fried calamari. You can basically prepare it and cook it the same way you do with any other fish out there using the same batter. You can top it off with a little bit of lemon, pour lemon on there, make a homemade mayo sauce to dip it in, some tartar sauce. And finally, the most easiest way, either if you're a very advanced in cooking or you just want something to have right there with your squid, is easily incorporating it with your soup. So you can go to a pho, pho shop and order takeout, bring it back home and throw your squid into the pho and it tastes really good. If you don't wanna do that, you can have top ramen lying around at home, cup noodles, easily incorporate it to that and it tastes just as good. Just an easy way to incorporate squid with whatever you're cooking. That's pretty much it. You can find me all over social media if you do follow me. You can always find me on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. We have a great page on Facebook called Pacific Northwest Selfish and Squid. There's actually a couple of the admins that are in here in the audience today. You can ask away. This is a great page if you are on Facebook <laughs> to learn and gain some new information because that page is just filled with awesome, great members and admins willing to help out with whatever information or questions that you have, all the way from basically spreading all shellfish throughout Washington State, ranging anywhere from where to catch these shellfish and how to cook and prepare your shellfish. So filled with a whole bunch of great information. You can also follow me on my blog page, Fishing with Sea Bass, where I post all my fishing adventures that I go on throughout the years, post some great blogs and info about what gear I was using and how that day of fishing went for me on that day. And you can also follow me on my personal page, Sebastian Chick, where I'm on there most of the time and post on there most of the time. You can also find me on Instagram and YouTube at Fishing with Sea Bass. That's it for the seminar. Stick around, pull out your raffle tickets. We're going to do a raffle here. Thank you all for joining. Sorry if I was stuttering a little bit. It's my first seminar. I'm still getting it down. So if you want to pull out your raffle tickets, Nick and Jack, you want to come up here and help me real fast? Oh yeah, if you don't have a raffle ticket, raise your hand if you're attending. Awesome, okay. We can get those raffle tickets to you guys. Where's the basket right here? Mm -hmm. Awesome, okay. And also, my good buddy and Slayer Squad member, Nick Fox right here. If you want to get some more squid jigs, he has a whole bunch for sale right here. So raise your hand again if you don't have a raffle ticket. Actually, here. Nick, uh, can you put your squid jigs down real fast and help me out? Okay, thank you. Yeah. Here, take that right there. Take that batch and then go. Just keep keep the basically tear out. Yeah, fold it in half. And give that to them and then keep that one. Okay, there we go. We didn't get one? Anyone in this row? All good? You guys got ours? Come over here. So, actually, hold on. It's always tricky with these things. There's one for you. Anywhere in this room? Yeah. Right there. How many do you need? Two. Two. Well, I think I have a lot of people. I got one. 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 I
have something more? For those of you back there? I will put these ones into the raffle basket. Okay, yeah, bring your, uh, ready to give away a whole bunch of awesome stuff. And we not only have squinting stuff incorporated in with these raffle baskets, we have a whole bunch of other awesome fishing gear. I can kind of open one bag up and see what we have. We also have three hats. So we have a Procure pamphlet right here, jam-packed full of all the Procure products that you can check out and order online. If you find something that you like, you can always contact them, get it, use it for fishing. In some of these bags, we have these little hide-a-bobber things. It's really cool. It's a bobber incorporated with a hook, so you can easily pull it in. Just, it's really great. I've tried this on myself. It's pretty cool. We have some either Procure stickers or Silver and Gold Star stickers. Some Procure samples. We also have some spoons and stuff for salmon from Silverhorn Gold Star also. We have some uh, Silverhorn Gold Star squid jigs also. So, we'll put that back in there actually. Ready? Okay, oh yeah. You wanna put one in with? Actually, okay, okay, yeah, that, that, work, that works out. That works out. That's, those are extra, okay. Right, everyone pull out the raffle tickets. Away, Jack. Yeah, I'll read it. I'm gonna read the last four numbers, or three numbers actually. So this one is 429. 429. Did they leave? Oh. <laughs> okay. Jack. Jack won! Oh. Alright, another one is 432. Hey, there you go. There you go. No problem. Another one? You want to hand out like two? two jigs? That can be a smaller prizes later. Okay. We'll hand out these ones first. 387. 387. There we go. Here, Jack. Congratulations. There you go. Back there. Kind of go rapid fire here. And if you have any questions and you will look at, want to take a look at some of the gear I was using here, you can come up here after we're done with the raffle and check them out. 418. There you go. We have a whole bunch of stuff to give away. 392. There you go. Jack, you want to pick one? Let's save Three, seven, nine. There you go. Here, right there. Three, seven, nine, raise your hand. There you go. Is that one? Three, five, nine. Hey! Hat. Right here, there we go. Okay. Savory, you want to pick one up? Four, four, three. Hey, there you go. There you go. Four, one, two. Four, one, two. There you go. Savory, you want to go back there? Here. Draw one out. Draw one out. Draw one out. Four, one, five. There you go. Three six six. Three six six. Going once, right there. Awesome. There you go. See everyone drawing up again. Oh hi, Seth. Hey, buddy. Three seven six. 
Hey, there we go. Three, six, one. Hey. You want a hat or a uh, package? I'll take a package. Okay, awesome. That was the last package right there. Then we have two hats left over, and we also have some uh, Nick Foxes right here, Foxy Jigs, to give away. Awesome, okay. Three, nine, eight. There you go. That one is right somewhere. Last hat right here. Three, six, five. Right there behind you, right there. There you go. All right, Nick, how much you got? How much you got? How many squeezes you got? To give out. What? Those four right here? Okay. We'll do uh, two each. So we have some of Nick Fox's squid jigs right here. Give me out two Seahawks color if you're a Seahawks fan. Pick them out. Nick, pick them out. The number is 382. What? Oh, that's you? Oh. <laughs> okay. There's one right there. 381. There you go. Here, right there. Sorry we don't have a package for them. Last one is 419. There you go. There you go. Is that it? Is that it? Awesome. So, thank you all for joining my first seminar ever about squirting in the Puget Sound. Thank you all for joining. Enjoy your stay here at the rest of the Sportsman Show. If you have any questions, come up here. Ask away. They just see like the different content. They can see. Okay. Like, they just can't see like pink. They can't really see the pink. They just see kind of like the pink hue. You know how like something, yeah, something that is like black and white. You know how they put it in the contrast. You know, it has a different contrast. You can see that. But like they can't see the glow that gives off a little bit of warmth. So. Yeah, well, check it out. Yeah, it's from the pen. Yeah. 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 Do you have Facebook? I have a lot of Josh. Josh is one. It's like $400. I saw that. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. He likes shirts.
Yeah, that's why, uh, you know, the glow will last long because of that, you know, that fabric. Yeah. 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 Is that, that's interesting because I know they use mylar for the scale, like fish scales, but I didn't know that he... Yeah. <laughs> Something new to me, too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cool. <laughs> There's so many different things. <laughs>